Schwartz, and on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to welcome you to this public affairs program. Our guest this evening is Linda Greenhouse, and she is the author of Just a Journalist on the Press, Life, and the Spaces Between. Just a Journalist was adapted from a series of lectures Linda delivered at Harvard in 2015, and it will be the jumping off point for our conversation this evening. Linda brings to this discussion over 40 years of experience working as a journalist, first as a Pulitzer Prize winning Supreme Court reporter for the New York Times, later as a columnist there. In reading her bio, which I believe you all should have a copy of, you'll note that she has been recognized many times over for her contributions to journalism. She is currently the Joseph Goldstein Lecturer in Law at Yale Law School. In the next 30 minutes or so, Linda and I will have a conversation about the challenges facing journalists and journalism today, focusing on the hurdles journalists encounter in this fractious political landscape, and also the impact that independent journalism is having on this profession. Afterwards, I'll invite you all to ask any questions that you would like. Linda, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. While we all know that the press is under siege these days, as news organizations cover a president whose rhetoric mixes brazen falsehoods with incessant attacks on the integrity of the press. And while editors and writers want to meet their obligation to tell the truth in an objective and fair and balanced way, old rules seem to be eroding. All indications are that this is a very good moment for us to examine the practices and conventions of American political journalism. So why don't we begin by having you talk a bit about what it means to be a journalist today. Yeah, so this book grows out of, actually, concerns I've had that predated any thought that Donald Trump might be president of the United States. So for a number of years, I've been speaking, writing, you might say railing against uh, certain conventions of mainstream journalism that, in my view, disable journalism from serving its best and highest purpose. What is that purpose? It's to enable an informed citizenry to govern itself. Right? It's giving information. It's not simply parroting what two people on different sides of a debate choose to say. You know, if I quote, Somebody saying, uh, you know, by the way, the moon is made of green cheese. Uh, and that person actually said it. Nobody could demand a correction. It's not incorrect. But it's lacking context. It's lacking content. It's failing in its duty to say to the reader, by the way, that's not true. So as I was working on the lectures that I gave in November of 2015, of course, the campaign was starting. And the deal with those lectures is you turn them into a book. Harvard University Press publishes it. And of course, there was the campaign, and then there was the election before, before my due date for the manuscript. And so um, I had to throw out a bunch of sort of abstract and theoretical stuff and anchor it in really an account of how the mainstream press, and it's mostly the New York Times, but not exclusively, uh, dealt with this challenge of a major political figure given to telling lies. And what do you do about that? It challenged the kind of, uh, the, really, the DNA of mainstream journalism, which is that you don't call somebody out. You simply tell the reader what they said. So then you would say that the Trump campaign really, in some way, um, has uh, killed the notion of objectivity in the press because it's important, as you say, to call him out in some way, and no longer can it be fair and balanced if he's splurting out. Lies. Yeah, I mean, quote, fair and balanced, or quote, objectivity, is a trap that uh, people who are very good, who are well paid and highly motivated and very good at manipulating the press can invoke. Oh my god, you're not being fair. You're not being balanced. You're not being, quote, objective, because you're calling us out. And uh, for many, many years, that worked. It was very easy to um, stop the media in its tracks by saying, uh, you're, not, you're not being balanced, right? Uh, there are two sides to every story. Well, actually, there's not two sides to every story. 
Some stories, there's only one side, you know, torture. Torture is a bad thing. We shouldn't be waterboarding people. That's, I talk a lot about the transition from being afraid of calling waterboard, waterboarding torture to finally doing it. Or very complicated issues can't be reduced to two sides. They might have 30 sides, I don't know. Uh, so the notion that there are two sides to every story and it's the highest and best purpose of journalism to boil everything down to that is... As I say, it's, it's, it's a trap. It's a disabling trap. And I'd like to think that we're getting over that. With Donald Trump is somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, you know, I, yeah. I mean, I end the book by saying, okay, has anything changed fundamentally? Will these changes that I chronicle um, and applaud uh, outlast Donald Trump? Well, you could say, will any of us outlast Donald Trump? That's another question. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but assuming there's a journalism after Trump, um, will, will we have a kind of regression to the mean and go back to the old way? Or has something changed in our DNA? Has something changed profoundly? Well, it seems to have been changed with Donald Trump's presidency, but do you see it in reporting any other stories that, you know, you talk about the post-truth era where, you know, misconceptions and prejudices are sort of being put aside. Is that true in other stories as well as just political journalism? Well, I think it's become true in, in science, for instance. Um, you know, there was a long time when the notion of climate change was regarded as a debatable issue, and you couldn't just assume that people accepted the notion. You always had to quote the smaller, smaller, smaller to infinitesimal deniers to give balance to that story. That's no longer happening. So I think science is one area. Um, you know, you could probably find, find others. But, you know, there are major areas that we need to know about and that the press covers, you know, economics. I mean, you know, is the tax cut good or bad for most people or for the economy? So, I mean, you, you know, that's not, there's not an obvious answer to that. So you don't look for an obvious answer. You do look for... Uh, a rich and contextual discussion of the way things might go instead of just a soundbite. Well, do you think then the ethics of reporting has changed in some way in journalism today? Or are the standards have always been the same and will continue to be so then? Well, I think the, the, um, the stated standard has, has always been the same. I mean, I begin the book maybe a little, you know, pretentiously, I don't know, uh, with a quote from Walter Lippmann. Um, and if you, you have the book there, I mean, I'm, oh, yeah, here's, I mean, I'll just quote a bit from it because it just, you know, when I came upon this uh, passage from Walter Lippmann, it was a speech he gave on his 70th birthday to the National Press Club. And he says, um, if the country is to be governed with the consent of the governed, then the governed must arrive at opinions about what their governors want them to consent to. How do they do that? And he goes on and say they do it by being exposed to a robust and hardworking press uh, who gets, gets the story. Um, in this, he says, we do what every sovereign citizen is supposed to do, but has not the time or the interest to do for himself. This is our job. It is no mean calling. We have a right to be proud of it and to be glad that it is our work. So that's, you know, that's always been the standard, but I think these these norms of he said, she said, of, uh, you know, the kind of false balance. Uh, I have a lot of examples in the book of this habit that has driven me nuts for many years, which is, uh, you know, you can't have, you can't have the reporter uh, saying something on her own authority. You've got to put it in the words of some purported expert. Uh, you know, somebody with a title, often the title is professor, and you get some professor to say it. Uh, because that sounds more credible, that kind of thing, uh, is very, um, as I say, d disabling. Uh, so there's been a divergence between what we say we're doing and then what actually happens in, in, in the newsroom. So you don't think it's necessary then or even important for journalists to present both sides of the issues? I mean, what you're saying, it seems to me, is that if there is one side, like in torture versus waterboarding, or what it, which is torture, that you can say it without having to present somebody else's viewpoint. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, you know, you, I mean, 
you're not operating in the abstract. You're operating within a, a political context. And so, um, you know, in that kind of story, you would say, uh, you know, John Yu in the Office of Legal Counsel wrote a memo that justified this. Uh, however, uh, back before the US started doing it, it was very common for the US to call it torture, to call it a war crime. All of a sudden, now we're doing it, and like it's okay because there's a memo. I mean, you you spelled all that out. You just, you know, I, I mean, something I write about, something I've always felt strongly about is context. Context matters, and assume your readers or your viewers are smart enough to to want and need and be able to understand uh, the nuances of of context beyond the beyond the soundbite. Well, you call yourself an accidental activist in the cause of breaking barriers between the role of a journalist and that of a citizen. Um, so does this, who do you think you, as a journalist, owe your allegiance to then? Would it be the public, or would it be to you yourself in reporting? As a journalist? Yes. Um, I always thought to my, to my readers. And, uh, and I saw my role as um, not telling readers what to think. I mean, now, of course, I'm, since I write an opinion column, I'm paid to tell them what to think. And an right. opinion column without opinions is, is right. a failure. But uh, <laughs> back in my earlier phase, uh, not to tell them what to think, but to empower them with information in context uh, to think for themselves and figure it out for themselves. So um, I think I was pretty clear on that. The, the quote, activism, uh, that I write about in the autobiographical parts of the book uh, come from my belief that there's a separation between uh, what one does on the job, which is to adhere to the standards I set for myself, uh, and um, the role that one takes as a citizen in, in a democracy. Um, you know, can I express my, my view of the world um, when I'm not on the job? and you know, I argue yes. Do you think it's, I mean, has it been difficult for you to separate yourself from being a citizen or a journalist? Or is it just easy because you believe that you need to, you know, put the context in for people? To I didn't think it was difficult. Others seem to have a difficulty with it. Um, to me, the, the boundaries were pretty clear. And I never thought that I transgressed them. And I didn't set out to transgress them or to make an example. I just did what I thought um, was my right and duty as a citizen to do. Right. You talked about um, that you were contributing to Planned Parenthood and all that, and you posted it, and you got a lot of you know, feedback not so positive about doing so. But do you think the boundaries have changed now between being the journalist or being the citizen mm -hmm. journalist in some ways? Well, if we have time, maybe I'll just read that part, that little passage about this, because I can let people in on what we're talking about. Um, because when, when the book came out in October, um, a writer for the Washington Post uh, found it very shocking that I, quote, admitted that I gave money and still give money um, to Planned Parenthood. And this was. Um, this was how that came about. So I say, um, every year, back in my early reporting days in, in New York on the Metro desk, every year the publisher, uh, Punch Salzberger, who was himself a great supporter of Planned Parenthood, um, solicited employees to authorize a payroll deduction for contributions to United Way. When I worked in New York, I always contributed after checking the list of United Way beneficiaries and seeing that Planned Parenthood was on the list. When I arrived in Washington, in the Washington Bureau, I checked the list and was surprised to find that the local Planned Parenthood affiliate was missing. I called United Way in Washington to ask why. After being passed among several employees, I finally reached someone who told me that the problem was that Planned Parenthood was, quote, controversial. I replied that I didn't see much controversy in curbing the high teen pregnancy rate in the District of Columbia, and that I would henceforth make my own contribution directly to Planned Parenthood. I described this encounter in a letter to Arthur O. Salzberger, the Times publisher, and posted a copy of my letter on the office bulletin board, urging colleagues to follow my example. 
If anyone did, they kept that knowledge to themselves. So I, re I read that just say, I mean, there was never anything uh, secret about anything I did in my role as a citizen. Um, uh, what changed, I think, was a kind of a sanctimonious spasm that overcame mainstream journalism in response to the bullying on the right. And we all know the way to deal with the bully is not to submit to the bully, is to stand up to the bully, but that doesn't usually happen. Uh, and so, uh, you know, this fellow from the Washington Post or other people who've, who've read this, like, oh my God, how could she have done that? Well, nobody seemed to have a problem with it at the time. Do you think things have changed? Yes. This, the boundaries have changed? I think, I think they have because of uh, fear, because of fear. Fear of? Fear of uh, being bullied from the right. Well, fear of being called non-objective. Well, you talk about um, being bullied, so I guess that's a perfect segue into our current president. And I'd like to know he has come out and he has suggested that the press doesn't really like America. He has said the media is the enemy of the American people. He has repeatedly called journalists the most dishonest people. He has worked to paint news stories he doesn't like as fake and claimed he created that term. And last night he announced the fake news award. I guess you didn't get one. I, I don't know how you feel about that. But um, I noticed in the lineup, I mean, several people at the New York Times did. But so how do we address a president who is constantly attacking and demonizing the media? I think just, uh, you know, doing journalism's job, which is to uh, report what he says and what he does, and to the extent that there's dissonance between those two things, to explain it and, you know, exemplify but, it. But today, in reading the news, there's an opinion um, section mm -hmm. where people have said that they really think that Donald Trump is doing a great job. So the, the press, although they're coming out and pointing out these things, where is the disconnect? I mean, how do you convince people in some way that this man is really sort of a detriment to the fourth estate? Well, I mean, the 30% of the country, that's his apparently unshakable base. And these were the people who responded to the invitation of the Times to write letters describing it. Um, you know, they're maybe not reachable. But, you know, they have access to the same information that we all do in this room. And they draw different conclusions from it. And, uh, you know, I don't see the role of the press to be, you know, changing their minds. It's to make sure that information is flowing and always available so that if any of those people do wake up and, you know, want to see things in a different way, that's available to them. But I, I certainly, you know, don't see the role as metaphorically, you know, shaking them by the lapels and saying you're, you're wrong. Um, Rather, I think the, I mean, I, I don't know what led into that feature today that took over the editorial page. I found it very interesting because, you know, we all live in a, here we are sitting on the east side of Manhattan. So I think it's, it's important and it's, it would be a failure of journalism not to take account of uh, what those folks think about what's going on as part of our national story. And I was very interested to see it actually. Okay, well, let's move then to today where the news media, I'd like to spend a few minutes on this, is undergoing drastic change. I mean, because there are many opportunities for independent journalists, you know, to write what they think, following what we were just discussing. And there are blogs, and everyone who's writing a blog can write it in real time. News is available. So what does this do with, you know, long-term investigative journalism that has taking the time to point out, you know, the facts, what is right, you know, fair and balanced. And, and then again, the um, idea that people are within bubbles talking only to each other. So how do you address this challenge in journalism today? Yeah, so that's a very complicated, you know, kind of multifaceted issue. I mean, one issue is the, the siloing of, of the media and the audience, right? So, you know, and I'm, I mean, this is not an original thought that back when you and I were growing up, you know, everybody watched one of three networks and was getting the same news at the right. same time. And now uh, we, we segment ourselves and we select ourselves. And, you know, the president gets his news from one particular outlet and, you know, goes immediately um, into, you know, into his Twitter account. But um, so that's one, that's one issue. Um, 
The other issue, I mean, I think the multiplicity of voices and the low cost of entry to having your voice amplified um, uh, through social media and on the internet uh, obviously has its problems, but I think is more good than bad and enables um, people to just be better informed. But it takes, uh, it takes some sophistication. And obviously, you know, when the Russians were using Facebook or whatever they were doing to, you know, shake people up during the election, you know, that's an example. We need sophistication. I read a couple months ago, I guess, in the Times that um, the education establishment in Italy is working on a curriculum uh, to start, starting it in the lower elementary grades to teach students how to be sophisticated consumers of news and of the internet. And it's, of course, we don't have a national curriculum in this country, but you know, I think that's something, something we might think of. Um, but I write, in, in the book, I write about um, you know, a certain kind of crisis in my mind uh, when I realized that uh, the Supreme Court, which I was covering, uh, put up a pretty decent website on which people can read the briefs, uh, people can get the transcript of the arguments, people can get the opinions within minutes of the opinions being issued. And I thought to myself, what's my role? You know, has the internet just kind of made me obsolete? Why, did they, why does anybody need me? And then I, you know, kind of working that through over a period of time, I realized that what they needed me for was the context. You know, where did the case come from? What does this decision mean? What's the next chapter? Uh, how does it fit in with this, that, and the other thing that has happened in the past or is going to happen in the future? And that actually made the job more, more rather than less challenging and interesting to me. So I think you know, that kind of real-time information um, is really important. But it's not the end of the story. It's not the whole story. There's still, I mean, maybe greater need than ever for smart contextual uh, journalism. Well, it seems to me the theme of this conversation has been about context. I mean, I think that's an important role for a live journalist today. Um, rather, writing in a newspaper is providing that context that you all need to understand more. We just hope that people will take the time to read that context and rather than just go, you know, to whatever, yeah. you know, the one-liner is if it's, you know, you get yeah, from... Yeah, right. You know, I mean, the, yeah, if it's just, you know, the one line on your phone. That's, well, that's do you a think, problem. Right. So do you think that journalism is then fulfilling its duty in a democracy today in terms of the way it's reporting on things with um, not everybody has that context, but so it's the one-liner. Does that take away from the duty of a journalist in some way? Well, is journalism fulfilling its duty? I mean, that's a really broad brush, Joanne, because so, you know, what is journalism? It's all these different elements. So, so journalism um, has evolved. Some then. is, yes. so, you know, yes. some is and some isn't. Right. So how would you define journalism then today? Well, I mean, it's, it's all these different so it's, kinds of it's voices much and outlets and, yes. and much wider. And it's, you know, um, but I mean, in, in a way, uh, you know, Donald Trump has been a boon to the New York Times. I mean, hundreds of thousands of more subscriptions have been sold because people feel the need to know things. Well, you always have to find the good in something and bad. I, right? I mean. I was at a conference uh, this summer in, um, in England, and it was a conference put on by the Canadian bench and bar, so many Canadian participants. And basically, everybody there told me they had just started subscribing to the New York Times, that they were desperately concerned about what was going on in the United States, that it had a great deal to do with, you know, Canada really cares, and they had a need to know, and they were buying this digital New York Times, and I thought, great. Absolutely. Well, I guess this um, goes to what you have written about saying that what the world needs is wisdom journalism. Say that again? What the world needs is wisdom yeah, journalism. Yeah, yeah. Not, not a line of mine. That's, I'm quoting a journalism scholar. For, right. For that. But so wisdom journalism then to you would mean sort of having the context with it and the understanding. Context and not falling into these traps of just quoting and letting the quote stand uh, unchallenged if it if it needs challenging. 
Well, I think you've given us a very good sense that journalism is still alive and it's important and that we need it, even though we have a Donald Trump who is degrading it at every turn. So I'd like to open this up to questions now, and I just ask that you please you know, go to the microphone, introduce yourself, and um, we'll continue the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Linda. I'm a fan of yours and uh, quite a journalistic junkie myself. I get five newspapers to my door every day. I have uh, uh, recently saw a very fine Ben Bradley documentary on television, which raised a lot of the issues which which you raised in this discussion, particularly his role as a friend, particularly to the Kennedys, and which was overridden as he became president, uh, what were, were his duties. But I'd like to throw one question at you, and that is, what should be the connection with the front page and the editorial page in as far as the front page accurately, unbiasedly reports the news? What should be the connection? Or, so or should there be a connection? There, if, if you pick up the New York Post or a, a right-wing paper, the Wall Street Journal, and then you pick up the Times or the Washington Post, the same event on the front page is depicted in an entirely different light. So what, what is your feeling about what should be the role of the editor in keeping the, the front page impartial and accurate? Well, see, there we are with, this, with the impartial stuff. So, uh, you know, I guess there's an old line, you know, news, news is what happens to an editor, right? So, <laughs> I mean, it's a judgment call as to, um, and we're talking from our generation, right? The front page. I mean, people don't look at a front page anymore, right? It's it's all digital. But uh, you know, what's important about what happened yesterday or an hour ago is going to be is is a judgment call. And and so, uh, you know, if if a paper that skews left thinks one thing is more important than a paper that skews right would think is important, I don't think that's a I don't think it's a lack of, I don't think it's a failing. I think it's inevitable, really, unless we had some kind of metric that, uh, you know, everybody has to see things the same way. But, but nor do I think it means that uh, the news judgment should simply be in service of the publisher's views as reflected on the editorial page, and I don't think that's the case. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure it's not the case. Um, I think there is a, a, a boundary and a distinction, but I think it's also the case, especially in the digital world where there's not a physical separation. I think that's lost on many readers and probably lost on more readers all the time. You know, if you just are reading the paper on your phone and it's serving up to you, uh, you know, interesting reads of the day, it's not really making a distinction between news and opinion, and um, that's an issue. It is. <clears throat> uh, Ron Berenbaum, you talked about the importance of context, and I know we all know, and some of us, including me, have even read uh, at least one of your books about the Supreme Court. So now, Trump, one of the great opportunities he's being presented with, and where he is uh, where his constituency apparently feels he's delivered is in the form of uh, 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 court appointments, particularly the Supreme Court, uh, but also the lower courts. But the context of history, and what I'm thinking of now is particularly your wonderful book on Justice Blackmun, that justices evolve so that we shouldn't necessarily expect Neil Gorsuch to be the most conservative justice on the Supreme Court 25 years ago, just as very few people would have expected Felix Frankfurter to have that role at a certain point when he was appointed during the New Deal, or at least one of them. So could you comment on what you, you, know, what you think about 
Trump's opportunities and how you think, uh, whether you think he can depend on these uh, people that he's appointed to evolve, yeah, so to so, speak? No, that's an interesting question. So there's actually been a fair amount of academic research on uh, what the political scientists would call not evolution, but uh, preference change uh, over the trajectory of, um, of a Supreme Court justice's career. And so um, there's one uh, kind of well-known article by um, Professor Michael Dorff from Columbia Law School. Uh, he looked at Republican-appointed justices from uh, the <coughs> mid-20th century, uh, you know, from the Warren Court. Um, and this article came out maybe five or six years ago. So it was mostly Republican appointees, those who shifted left and those who did not. And what do those two groups have in common? And the commonalities were really interesting. The ones who shifted left all came from, like Harry Blackman, <clears throat> way outside the Beltway, uh, not, didn't have any ties in DC, moved in midlife to Washington, DC, to take up this amazing position as a member of the US Supreme Court, kind of shakes you up. You know, kind of makes you question your priors, and you don't have a network that you're necessarily falling into. Uh, the ones who didn't change were um, the creatures of the Beltway, had uh, paid their dues in the executive branch or whatever. And uh, let's take uh, Chief Justice Roberts. When he moved from the DC Circuit to, I mean, this is, he's outside the frame of Michael Dorff's article, but just look at him. Uh, moved from the DC Circuit to the Supreme Court. His commute grew by about five blocks. That's it, you know, and he stepped, he's got a big network in Washington. The likelihood that John Roberts, well, I want to modify that a little because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on at the court, but, but he's not going to wake up someday and find himself a Harry Blackman. Actually, I'll segue into a, a funny story about John Roberts, if I may. Um, he went, uh, and I hear this, uh, Third hand, but it's very reliable. Um, went up, he was giving a talk in New Hampshire, and so he went to pay a call on uh, the retired Justice David Souter, who lives in Concord, New Hampshire. And uh, they were talking. And, um, and uh, Justice Souter made some comment about the flack that Chief Justice Roberts had taken for his vote in the health care case, in the first of the Obamacare cases. And, uh, and Robert said, oh, it's been terrible. He said, do you know what they call me? The names they're calling me? And they, Justice Souter said, well, I can imagine. No, do you know what they're calling me? Do you understand what they're calling me? He said, well, OK, tell me. What are they calling you? They're calling me Souter. <laughs> <laughs> so David Souter is an example of somebody who came without any Washington ties whatsoever from New Hampshire. Um, you know, and did he move left? I mean, yes, as the court moved right. So um, it's interesting. Will he, is Neil Gorsuch going to change? I mean, yes, he happened to come from Colorado, from the Tenth Circuit, but he's a creature of Washington. He grew up in Washington. He practiced law in Washington. Is he going to change? No, because he goes to the Federalist Society annual convention this summer and basically says, I'm your man. Thank you for your prayers. This is an exact quote. This is an exact quote. Not, not the I'm your man, but thank you for your prayers. So no, no, he's not going to change. And the Trump judges are being very carefully vetted. Well, some of them should have been vetted a little more before they you know, had to pull out. But ideologically, very carefully vetted and served up by the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation. It's all been outsourced. And uh, you know, there's not going to be any ideological mistakes. Uh, Warren Hogue, uh, now the International Peace Institute. Nobody ever complains with me when I say that. All the years I said the New York Times, right away they said, that newspaper of yours. You were hanging out in the wrong circles, Warren. <laughs> uh, Linda, I want you to help me uh, with, with a former New York Times person problem that I have. Uh, and that is, uh, and it happened to me just two nights ago, I was on a panel, and somebody was coming after me as a Times person, uh, saying, why did you give so much attention to the tweets? Um, 
This person even said had a money amount as to how many million dollars of free publicity it had amounted to. I have an answer for it, but I wonder, you must be asked that also. Is there something that editors could have done to... You're, doing the, you're talking about the campaign? I'm talking about the campaign. You yeah. know, these are people who say, I mean, they also say we gave, I say, still say we about the Times, we gave much, much too much attention to the criticism of Hillary Clinton. That's sort of another one. But the one that, that I find most, more difficult is when they say, you gave all that attention to the tweets. Uh, my answer is the tweets were news. The, the, the tweeting nature of tweeting was news. To have a candidate do that, to have a president do that. And it would have been hard to decide at what point do you not give attention to that. But if you've not heard that, I'm surprised, because that's what a lot of people come after me saying, you, you at times was irresponsible in devoting so much attention to the tweets and, and the claims and the lies. Um, I sort of tend to answer, what would you have done if you were the editor? At what point would you have said, we are not going to publish that? Because well, I think we know that's it's right. I mean, okay. I think that is the answer. But have you got a better answer? <laughs> yeah, that's a good answer. If anyone ever asks me that question, I'll say, well, as Warren Hogue said, that's a good answer. <laughs> to follow uh, Warren, which of course is very difficult, but uh, there's an area we haven't discussed yet, which is a main source of news for many people, and that is Facebook, the social media, without any real responsibility that the New York Times, Washington Post, whatever, the, the major uh, newspapers take upon themselves to check things out. What do we do when people are so influenced by whatever somebody says out of the blue? I mean, the answer is I don't know. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is obviously concerned about this and is changing the, changing the business model to the dismay of many publishers, I think, including the publisher of the New York Times. Um, you know, how that's going to play out, but it reflects um, I think a, a society, a societal um, discomfort with what happened in the campaign and, and with the ability of people to hijack social media for their own purposes. But I am not uh, plugged into that world enough or smart enough to presume to have a solution to it. I think there are a whole lot of smart people uh, thinking hard about um, about where that's going. Right, especially foreign influences such yeah, as the exactly, Russians. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, ma'am. Uh, Midshipman Ryan Torres, United States Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, my question goes in line with uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, stuff like that. Do you think those people who consider themselves bloggers or independent journalists who create these two-minute videos trying to condense very complex issue into two minutes. Do you think they would benefit from reading a book like yours? Or do you, and do you think, I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. They all should read it. <laughs> but do you think that more journalists should publish books about their time as a journalist so the average people can see more into the mind of what someone like you goes through? Well. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a lot out there. I mean, it's a matter of, you know, who's reading it or who's thinking about it. So, um, you know, I mean, I hope, obviously, I hope people do read my book, but I'm not, I'm not saying it's the key to all wisdom, uh, you know, in, the, in our present interesting set of, set of dilemmas. Um, but I think what you're reflecting as the earlier question is um, there's no... I mean, one thing that editors of mainstream media do is they, they curate. They're curators. I mean, that goes back to the question about, you know, page one looks different depending on the point of view of the newspaper. Um, you know, I mean, MoMA is not the Met. And there are curators who bring their intelligence and decide, uh, you know, what's, what's on offer, what's on exhibit. Uh, a certain time, and we're used to that. We grew up, those of us older than you, grew up assuming that that was the case, and now it's not for a lot of, of certainly for the new media, and that's very um, disorienting. 
it's also very enabling. It gives people voices who never would have had a voice. And, you know, I wouldn't sit up here and say that's a priori a bad thing. Maybe it's a great thing. Uh, we're in a transitional period of, uh, you know, disruption and chaos in many aspects of our social and political life. And um, some new norms will evolve from it, and I hope they're constructive, but we're, we're, you know, we're intervening now in the process of evolution. It's very, um, it's very interesting, but I don't know where it, I don't, I can't sit here and say I know how it's going to end up. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, is it okay? Um, my name is Ann Phelan. I'm a freelance editor. I wanted to ask a question about your time reporting on the Supreme Court. And what level of fluency in legal? Can you speak a little louder? Sure. Yeah. What level of fluency in legal issues did you uh, assume your readers had, and how did you know or learn how to write a piece that would appeal to both uh, experienced attorneys and people who had no legal background or training? Yeah. Um, so I had a vision of who I was writing for, which was a New York Times reader. So I assume them to be uh, intelligent, interested, not needing to be spoon-fed, not needing to be kind of lured into a story with like an anecdote at the top and that kind of thing. Um, people basically, much like myself, before I had the opportunity to spend a year on a fellowship at Yale Law School, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I did do a one-year master's program as preparation for covering the court. And you know, climbing a learning curve that I I'm still climbing, frankly, uh, you know, to go back and say, OK, if I were that person pre all this experience, uh, what would I need to know about what just happened at the court uh, to be able to make my own, come to my own informed judgment about it? I don't need Greenhouse to tell me what to think. I need her to tell me what happened in a way that makes sense to me and that I can, that I can understand it. Uh, and you know, when I started on the beat, I, I I set that as a very deliberate thought process as I was organizing a story. Uh, over years, of course, it just became instinctive. But, um, but that's who I had in mind. And, and actually, the nicest letter I got, the one that meant the most to me when I retired in 2008 from the, from the, time, from the Daily Times, um, and I got a lot of you know, letters and stuff. And one person who I had no idea who they were just said, Thank you for never talking down to us. And I took that as a high compliment. But thank you for asking. Hello. Peter Russell is my name. Um, you've given us a good notion of how reporters and editors can respond to the challenges. But could you speak a little bit about the uh, legal and regulatory you know, official context with, uh, we're seeing now? where uh, reporters are denied access, there are threats of uh, libel action, uh, there could be uh, licensing questions, uh, tax pressures, who knows uh, what. Thank you. Yeah, well, I mean, reporters have always been denied access, right? I mean, it's not, it's not as if there was a golden age where, um, y you know, Federal officials said, "Oh, come on in and let me open my book." So, you know, we want to we want to be you know clear on that. And I mean, look at Richard Nixon with his enemies list. You know, the difference was, I mean, Nixon didn't have social media as a megaphone, so some of that came out after the fact, and it was a different different kind of climate. So, um, to be perfectly honest, I don't take a lot of that terrifically seriously. I think it's a lot of bluster. I mean, the the you know. We're going to redo the libel laws. Oh, yeah? Really? Really? Um, uh, you know, I mean, would it be great to have an open door? I mean, you know, I just saw the movie The Post, which I highly, highly recommend people see, even though apparently some Times editors are so annoyed at the Times not getting proper credit that they've announced publicly that they're not going. I don't even get that, but that's what they said. Um, you know, and that's like, you know, a great example of uh, brave and out there journalism. So, you know, that'll persist, and uh, and there's always attention, and maybe there always should be. It keeps people, 
keeps people motivated and it keeps their juices flowing. So I, I don't actually see that in a kind of a crisis term. Hi, Linda. I'm Hi. Tom Herman. I teach a seminar at Yale, and we talk about journalism ethics. I wanted to follow up on your comments before about the role of journalists and their roles as private citizens. Where do you draw the line? For example, could a journalist, not an opinion writer, but can a journalist contribute to political campaigns? Can a journalist march? Can a journalist speak at a college reunion and speak their mind without their public editor coming down on them? Where do you draw the line, and how? So as to those last two, I say absolutely. Uh, to the political campaign, I'd say probably not, and I didn't. Um, so, but you know, um, some very famous newspaper editors say that they don't think reporters should even vote. And I don't agree with that. I think that's a core right of citizenship. And um, I've never not voted. And I hope I'm, you know, uh, with it enough in the rest of my life to, you know, keep voting. I can't imagine saying I'm going to put my citizenship on the shelf uh, because of, uh, because of who, who writes my paycheck. So, but you know, people, people are entitled to, uh, to draw lines for themselves that meet their own comfort zone. But I would say that. Um, Say, for instance, the Times uh, told people a year ago, you may not go to Washington to the Women's March, or I suppose to any of the Women's Marches. Uh, that was an edict that came down. And um, I don't know how, I mean, I'm not in the newsroom anymore, so I really have no idea how people responded, whether they were sorry about it and stayed home, whether they were sorry about it and went anyway, whether they thought this is right. I, I honestly have no idea. But um, I'd like to think that had I been in the newsroom and I got that edict, I would have said, well, nuts to this. And uh, you know, I care about the world, and I'm going. And I would have gone. Can I follow up on that? Am I correct that New York Times columnists, although you're free to express your views on nearly everything, that you're strictly forbidden from endorsing someone for president? I ask that because Paul Krugman once said, that's the one thing he can't do. Is that still true? Only the publisher can? I honestly don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I'm, I'm not an employee of the Times. I'm a freelance contractor, so I, I don't know. Um, do you think that there is any information that is too dangerous to print? You, you mean like the how to make a nuclear well, well, bomb? Well, you brought up the Pentagon Papers. You know, the New York Times got that. But in today's age, is there, in your opinion, anything that is just too dangerous to print? Well, I mean, that was kind of the whole question of the Pentagon Papers, right? Right. But going forward, that was then. So, this is now. Right. Uh, y you know, and uh, yeah, I suppose, I mean, there's a number of recent cases where the Times has withheld um, information with military consequences because the uh, government has asked them to withhold it. Um, and, you know, I don't argue because with that. it's a judgment call. Because it's a judgment call. Yeah. And I, you know, that's why the editors get paid the big bucks. Right, to make those decisions. Yeah, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't quarrel with that. Right. Um, I welcome any additional questions. If not, um, I'd like to, one more question? Okay. I'm uh, Midshipman Blaze Newman, also from the Merchant, Merchant Marine Academy. Um, recently, CNN came out with a commercial about their real news, and I, if my memory serves me correctly, I saw a similar thing on NBC. Uh, I was wondering if you think that is necessary, or it, will it become a uh, continuing, continuing trend as a common practice to have to defend the uh, news's credibility in uh, today's world? If, if, I, if I heard you or if I understand the question, media putting out advertising? Yes. So, I mean, the Post has a great line, democracy dies in darkness. They've adopted a slogan. The Times is running, um, you know, ran an ad, I think, during the Super Bowl last year. Uh, you know, truth is hard, truth is, you know, vital truth is. 
bunch of uh, kind of slogans, and um, I think that's good, actually. I mean, make people think. Make people think about uh, what they rely on and what keeps our government um, honest. Before we conclude, is there anything else that you might like to address or be No, I think we, I think we covered the anything? territory. Right. right. Oh, oh, one more question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. It was a nice talk. I look forward to reading your book. I'm Wendy Diller. I'm a science and business writer. Um, my question actually had to do with the, just to do with the, with the current Supreme Court and what you see as what couple of cases you are most interested in for this term. Um, right now? Yeah. Um, well, of course, the court has had only one opinion uh, this entire term. There's something very weird going on at the court. Uh, I mean, everybody's just scratching their head over this one, one opinion this entire term. So I'm very interested in like all the cases they've argued since October 2nd. And where are they? Um, I'm very interested right now in uh, this whole ridiculous controversy over the Trump administration's uh, refusal to let pregnant teens in immigration detention exercise their constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. And there is such a case at the Supreme Court right now that justices have been sitting on it for a couple of weeks. Um, uh, the case is moot because the girl got the abortion thanks to uh, lower court and uh, the ACLU lawyers. Uh, but the, um, the Trump administration has gone in uh, making a series of uh, frivolous and ridiculous uh, requests of the court, including sanctioning the lawyers who got the abortion for this girl. So I'm very interested in what's going to happen with that. And we should hear within a very short time. Thank you. When, you. when you say that there's something weird going on at the court, court what do you mean? What do I mean you is said it's very it a few weird. Times. It's January, 9, January 18th, and they've only had one opinion for the entire term. That is strange. I mean, there's a black box there in, in which you know the justices interact and do whatever they need to do to produce opinions. And there's something that's coming up the works, and I don't know what it is. We, I mean, opinions will start flowing. Every case that's argued will be decided or will have some kind of explanation. Uh, and so eventually we may know what has happened between October 2nd when the term began and whenever the next opinions flow, but we don't know now. Yeah. Linda, you may have ideas about being objective, fair, and balanced, but I'd like to thank you for answering each question in a very fair and balanced way. So, and I'd like to invite you all to join, to join the conversation.